Dave Pryor. Welcome to the Reluctant Agilist. Nigel Baker is back. This For you, it's his first time. For us, it's our second time because we recorded one and it technically soiled the bed. So we're going to try again. Thank you for your patience, Nigel. No, it was, but the last episode was so good that even technology couldn't hold it. It, yes. it collapsed. It was so <laughs> mind-blowing. The, the entire agile internet collapsed under it. Maybe one day. There'll be spoilers from it, maybe, but... The Lost Reels. The Lost Reels. The Lost <laughs> Film, you know. Yes. This is the famous Lost Project. But this one will be almost equally, might be as good. Yes, and and we've got all our Doctor Who conversations out of the way. <laughs> but I might spring that question again at the end, because yeah. I thought that question was pretty a pretty yeah. cool question to have a conversation about. But mm-hmm. um, we're going to talk all about quarterly planning mm-hmm. and some of the challenges that... Yeah creates and i've been really struggling with it so i'm hoping you can give me some ideas on what i should share with the people i'm trying to help with it um before we jump into that would you mind kind of running down your origin story and tell people i'm going to say this carefully because yesterday i said it incorrectly when the radioactive spider bit you not where the radioactive spider bit you (laughs) <laughs> a radioactive scrum master bit me and so <laughs> that was interesting I, I i i for me it's almost like an origin story i know that we said it like a superhero but yeah. it really is like i started off this i've been doing literally scrum for 20 years scrumming okay. 20 years right um over 20 years actually and i originally started doing this i was a developer i love being a software developer that was my my, not my dream job, but I grew up around computers. My right. fa- like my father had a computer before I was born, and it was the mid seventies. So we were a tech house, right? And so I just liked computers, and I enjoyed doing it, and I enjoyed programming. And I got a programming job in a big company. What was and your I'm first sitting, computer? Uh, we had a Commodore PET. Okay, originally. Commodore PET. Then we had an Apple II, I believe. So you went from cassettes to floppies. Uh, we no um, the the Commodore PET actually had a disk drive. Oh, oh okay. disk drive, yeah. Okay. Um, but the the Apple the Apple had an Apple two. We yeah. had very expensive disk drives. We had BBC. I don't know if you had the BBC over in America, but um, Acorn in the UK invented okay. a computer in conjunction with the British Broadcasting Corporation called wow. the BBC. It was yeah. an incredibly popular computer in schools. Every single school okay. had one, or even maybe two but probably one and my father had one of those and wrote wow. programs on it so he wrote his own programs in basic for doing a variety of things i okay. got learning how to program on that so that's why i learned to program wow. back in the mid 80s i imagine <laughs> and then from that into well spectrums vic 20s dragons all eight bit machines from the past right. into the pcs in the 90s and so but i i but most of these things, I, I basically got into programming to get into computer games. Because I okay. love computer games. I thought, okay. I'll become a programmer, I'll get into computer games. And then, of course, the story goes, the minute you start programming for a living, things like computer games lost their luster. Yeah. I was kind of, it's kind of like, hey, do I want to go home and, and do more work? And Because you look at everything from a different eye. Yeah. You, know, you see it differently once you start working in it. Hey, anyway, working for a big company living this life on these train tracks we're going in one direction yeah. no changing no deviation going very my slowly career. i can very slowly but i can remember my career path and oh i started doing c then i got into sql then java and it's all going this one way and then we're on a project it's not going that well it's bigger than what we normally would do which is sort of quick dirty stuff right and start the project manager is not coping so it gets pushed to one side and one of the teams said hey we should try this thing called Scrum. So right? you started with Scrum. Okay, I started yeah. with XP. Now, here's the funny thing, right, with Scrum, was uh, what we didn't know was this guy, oh, name him, John McNeil, a lovely guy. He right. had been on, I think, the second ever Scrum course ev- in Europe, ever. Wow. <laughs> ever. Wow. So, like, there's like three, there's been like four courses before this. In yeah. t- we didn't know this. We just thought, oh, here's this big American thing. Everyone's doing it. Not right. realizing no one was doing it. Turns out ignorance is a great defense. <laughs> like if you do, if you don't know something's impossible, it's yeah, completely possible. So so we do it and it goes great. It goes absolutely great. Our my boss at the time, Jeff Watts, who's now incredibly famous and read all these books, he was Scrum Master. And okay. he just said the other day to me, he said, I'm Scrum Master because John McNeil said, you're a terrible project manager, but you sound more like this, like a Scrum Master. <laughs> so he became Scrum Master and did a great job. Okay. He got promoted, we went back to his main job. And so I said, okay. They said to me, do you want to be Scrum Master? And I said, 
Oh yeah, sure. Guess might as well. <laughs> Sounds yeah. fun. Move up the ladder, you know. So I started doing that. Stepped away from coding, and okay. that's only that's my one regret really. My one regret is um, programming is not like riding a bicycle. In that once you stop yeah. doing it, you really stop you lose doing your chops. It. So, yeah, yeah, you lose. I've lost my chops, right? And so by going to Scrum Mastery, doing that nicely, then Scrum sort of stopped. We started doing some project management bits and bobs, and then they said to me, "Hey, Nigel." Do you want to be an agile coach for the company? Do you want to take these agile wow, ideas okay. and travel around the company? You apply for the job and go for it. And I said the magic words, um, is it more money? Yeah. And they said, oh, yeah, you'll get a, get a pay rise. I was like, oh, excellent. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Line me up. As long as there's not too much travel, I'll mm-hmm. be fine. Turns out there's loads of travel. Yeah. Loads there of it. Were. Well, it used to be four yeah. or five days a week, especially when I was a coach. I was traveling around that company. I was staying away four days a week uh, in hotels, coaching across the company. Yeah. And then finally, I went independent. Went independent. I got my certified scrum trainer just before I went independent, about 2006, okay. 2007. And then I've been, been an agile coach, trainer, consultant for my own company, Agile Bear, where you could buy many good products and services. Uh, that's the advertisement. I've been okay. working for Agile Bear ever since. And so that's been now 16 years. 16 so are years. You, are you a coach who trains or a trainer who coaches? This is interesting. So I started apparently, off. Apparently Siri needed to weigh in on that too. Well, I, Siri's got an opinion on this. Uh, but do you want to cut that or what? But let's keep going. Well, with improv. Yes, and. Um, I don't know. That's a really profound question. I always regarded myself as an Agile coach. Right? An okay. Agile coach. I did that first. I got into training because basically we needed to train a lot of people and okay. coaching is quite small group intense yeah. and we just needed volume. So, but when I started training, I really liked it. You know, okay. I think I'm a good coach, but I'm a great trainer. I'm a great, I'm a great trainer. Awesome. Um, now the problem with that is, is you can love the sound of your own voice too much. As you can see, I've dominated the last minute. Right. But, and so I would say for myself, I am these days. Yeah. A, Agile consultant okay. who trains and coaches. That's right. what I'd say. So I just want to check with you on one thing. So I, I know that you do enjoy having sounds come from the pie yeah. hole. Um, but I find that at the end of a day of teaching, the last thing in the world that I want to hear is the sound of my own voice. I am so, <laughs> so sick of myself. I just can't even talk. Yeah. It's so interesting because I, I, people regard me as an extrovert, right? So, like, someone who loves to chat like this. Yeah. But actually, I think I'm a bit of an ambivert, really, in that I'm very extrovert in the right settings. But okay. after a training course, I'm down. I'm doomed. My wife thinks I'm quiet because wow. after a course, I come in, I sit down, I'm like, I am. It's all gone. Because I yeah. give it. I give it. And so, but I get a lot back. And so, like, for me, I, again, the extrovert side of me, I, I feed off people. Yeah. So people's energy, people laughing, people having, I really get fed, right? Which is, by the way, at the scrum gathering sometimes, I get overfed. I get a bit carried away because there's all these great conversations happening and great things happening. And I end up doing something like karaoke, which I had never done until I attended the scrum really? gathering. Yeah, never, oh, never. Okay. I thought you meant oh, until Amsterdam. But no, you've no, done karaoke I've, together. Okay. At scrum I had gatherings. never done it either. Yeah, All because you know I mean? of Trisha and Jessica. Yeah, it, you've got to get up there. Um, yeah. And so so I, I agree with you 100% on that. And it's why I'm a bit sad about the commoditization of coaching. Because yeah. I used to have a very lovely spread portfolio. Where I had a bit of training, a bit of advice, a bit of consultancy. So I can do my show, I can listen, but also I can be quiet, yeah. pay attention. You know, be be present in an office. Like be, I can anthropologist, be part of the experience. And because of the commoditization of coaching, I get less of those opportunities. Yeah. So when they come up, I really am. Oh, I'm having that. <laughs> that's what I need. That I need those people. I need to be in that place. Well, that's an awesome segue. So mm-hmm. I, I'm going to introduce the situation that, I, and I've faced it in a couple different places. I'll try to give a quick rundown of some of the things I've seen, and I'd like to try to talk about it from the perspective of why management might want it and what they might not understand about it, but also talk about it from the team perspective. I'm not saying this is good or bad. It's just what I've observed. So there are a number of clients I've worked with recently over the past year or so that have switched to this kind of safe-ish approach 
-hmm. where they're doing quarterly planning. And the way it tends to work is there are some senior level people like a product manager and some tech lead who have a conversation and decide this is what we need to accomplish in the next quarter. And then they go to the teams who are all too busy doing other stuff and say, can we do this in the next quarter? And like, yeah, sure. Because and they don't feel like they have the agency to say no. So they say yes. And then when they get to the work, they're like, oh, my God, this is so much bigger than we thought. But we only have 13 weeks, so they just try to divide it up amongst the sprints, and they try to plan it into the sprint. And so every single sprint begins with at least a week of carryover work. Yeah. The QA people are usually QAing like two two weeks into the sprint mm -hmm. from the previous sprint. Um, and this has become a totally normalized behavior. Yeah. So um, I want to talk about the reasons that you can see why management might want this, because I think there's a lot of good reasons for it but what is the team's ultimate ultimate responsibility in that situation is where i would like to to kind of end yeah. up yeah right. so now, if we take that question right at the start you know yeah i i am very much reminded of a joke from blackadder the the british tv show <laughs> where blackadder and his colleague um is calling through the calling through a minefield yeah right? And Blackadder's colleague, played by Hugh Laurie from House, uh -huh. turns to Blackadder and says, Blackadder, what do we do if we stand on a mine? And Blackadder looks at him witheringly and says, well, standard procedure is to throw yourself 100 foot in the air and spread yourself across the widest possible area. <laughs> like, you know, there's not much the team can do in, in that if we start there. Yeah. So what we need to do is take this apart a little bit and look at why these things happen, yeah. where they come from, and how they're introduced. Because there's a lot of sort of strategic and tactical issues there. Yeah. So the first things first is like I don't want to take the blame for PI planning. Okay. But when I was at British Telecom all those years ago as a coach, right. we were one of the first companies to invent something that looks a little bit like what you would call PI planning. Right. So can you? We would, you're going to explain what it is. For yeah, the yeah. Okay. So what we did back in the day was we had it wasn't really a release. It wasn't like a big. We wanted it to be like a big room workshop. That's what we were uh -huh. aiming for. Like a, get everyone together to plan. What actually BT did was have what they called a hot house, where they got okay. people together and competed them against each other to see who had the best solution for the next time period. So okay. kind of like um, Thunderdome. <laughs> Or, yeah. uh, uh, you know, there could be only one Highlander. Or like one of those things... hackathons where you've got to pitch yeah. to investors at the end. Yeah, exactly. Except you're pitching to the senior leaders about which yeah. idea is best. Again, pros and cons to that idea. It never really took off outside. Let's leave that there. But then BT, from this meeting, would have agreements and plans to go for the next 90 days. And okay. they have 90 day cycles. And there's all quarterly cycles. Now, why would a company do that? Right, because it sounds a bit crazy, but 90 days was incredibly controversial in that company at that time. Okay. 90 days was like so quick. 90 days, like when I was working there, when I not when I joined, but pretty much when I joined, I worked in uh, a part of the business called Fast Track, which was tactical development. Okay, because the idea was the company would take two three years to build something, yeah, and so and that's a huge gap to go without having that capability. Yep. So what Fast Track would do was quick and dirty, put a hacky thing out there to cover the gap. Okay. And of course, what happened was the gap that it became the strategic solution. Like I had up until not too long ago a late uh, a Y2K bit of software I wrote running in the background, covering for Y2K fallover. Okay. And running like 15 years after it should have been switched off. Can I add and a so, little context, a little project yeah. management context? So for the folks, for all you young people out there who don't remember <laughs> back yeah. in the day, um, like when I learned how to do this stuff, we would plan projects that would last years. Um, and you might not even yeah. release anything for six, nine months yeah. at a time. Yeah. And the problem is that by the time you deliver the thing, the client's needs have completely changed. Appreciate and it's it. too late. And it's too expensive. And yeah. it's very hard for a company like British Telecom, a big government yeah. entity, yeah. to make quick turns. Yeah. Yeah. It was like a super tanker. Mm -hmm. And so super tankers take two miles to turn. So 90 days was a great first attempt to chop this monster up. Okay. So look, let's try and get out once a quarter. So these companies were quarterly planning. It could be that the, what they had in the past was no planning <laughs> or planning yeah. over yearly planning. And so quarterly is like a huge step forward. So we've got to be careful with judgment because it could be a step forward. However, right, whilst 
it could be a step forward. It is a way of planning, not the only right. way of planning. And so the other thing to think about in terms of why we do this is, are people aware there are other options out there? Because mm-hmm. in terms of methods, the Scared Agile framework has said the heart of it is big room planning and release trains, which is effectively quarterly planning, effectively. And that isn't. <laughs> it isn't, right. it isn't the heart, maybe the heart of safe, but it's not the heart of reality. Reality means that's an option, not the only option. Right. So another conversation we're going to have to have in a minute is what other options are there? I'm not going to call them better just right. because they're different. <laughs> I mean, the, the, what people often get wrong is the difference between different and wrong. You know, okay. They get wrong the difference between, hey, that's right and that's wrong, and yeah. oh, that's an option and that's an option. So what we can do here, and let's say we're going to have a quarterly plan. Right? We're going to we're going to have a big room plan. We're going to plan out a quarter. Let's can just I, pretend. I want to check good. in with you on yeah. one thing first. So um, when I think about the quarterly plan, the problem that I see it solving for management is they used to have a Gantt chart, which would show everything that was supposed to happen for a year or several mm-hmm. years, and it was a hundred percent wrong but they had a plan and that mm-hmm. plan made them have this like sense of security. Like they could see the future. They yeah. knew it was going to happen. Um, and when we take that away, if we just go to scrum and you say, well, we're going to plan everything in two week cycles, you can't yeah. run a business that way. Yeah. So they have to be able to orchestrate all these teams and plan other efforts and things like that and fund it all. And this is one of the things that Dean's approach in safe kind of addresses with, with the release trains and stuff like that. Yeah. In fact, safe should be called certainty because what it is giving certainty, like this is what you must do. And that's very reassuring for humans. It's darkly reassuring. Like um, Dave Rock's model on scarf, like the things that trigger people. Mm -hmm. One of the key things that triggers people is uncertainty, like not knowing. I don't know where we're going, what's going on, losing control, feeling out of power. So I completely get certainty being very, very attractive, right? Like viscerally so, not just intellectually so. I saw at one of the scrum gatherings, Steve McConnell, the guy, the estimation guru. Mm-hmm. I remember him saying something very interesting at a gathering. He said, remember, businesses prefer wrong over vague. Yeah, absolutely. Like, because even it, if your plan is wrong, the yeah. fact that you have a plan yeah. makes you feel comfortable. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, so we get this. This is why we get it. right? However, <laughs> there are ways around this. And so for me, like I once had a session where a guy I used to work with, uh, rang me up and basically said to me, uh, Nigel, uh, I, I won't use his exact language because it included lots of bad language. But he said, uh, are you still doing that scrum sh- stuff? <laughs> and I said, yes, I'm still doing that scrum sh- stuff. And he said, okay, um, I've got a real cluster flip of a <laughs> project. Um, can you come and do your scrum stuff on it? Right. And now, Here's the project. Right? We go in there. I go and have a chat with him. And what basically happened was this. They had had a calendar of commitments, like a, a list mm-hmm. of things that were going to be built in it, pretty much a quarter. It was pretty much a quarter. Right? Now, he joined as a senior project manager. Right. So above him is like a deputy program director and a program director. The program okay. director owns the calendar. Right? Mm-hmm. The calendar was missed. So the program director got fired. So mm-hmm. the deputy became the program director. And the guy I knew became the deputy. Anyway, another calendar missed. Deputy gets another shot. execution. And so, yeah. And so he can see himself. He's got the top of the ladder now, but he's panicking because he can see the executions happening ahead of him. And, and he basically and said, "The important thing here for people to pay attention to is that in that model, which is what I learned, I got a master's degree in. The thing you worry about first when you wake up in the morning is the schedule. It's yeah. more important than people or outcomes or anything like that. It's all about the schedule." Yeah. No. And so they were tell- you know, he literally said to me, he said, I don't really know what Scrum is, Nige. I, t- I never did any- I just save my job. That's all I care. Save my job. That's all I want. I- I'll yeah. do anything you say. Save my job. And I got in there all ready to Scrum and be agile and all these conversations, right? And actually, the answer was simple. It was really simple. They were committing at too low a level of detail, too okay. far in advance. And that's all it was. They were making promises at a granular level right. that is not appropriate for the planning cadence they had. So you know we okay. call it quarterly planning. So it should be in quarterly lumps. Like what they were doing is doing quarterly planning, but the work was broken down, or not into hours, but well, like small slices. And guaranteeing uh, that far in advance got 
them into trouble because wanna, the world changed. The world varied on them. I want to ask you a question about this because some of the teams that I talk to, the way that they respond to the quarterly plan that there's basically hoisted upon them is the first uh, month is planning. So they create like a detail down to the subtask if you're in JIRA level of every yep. single thing they have to deliver in the quarter. They burn mm -hmm. a whole month doing that, and now they have much less time to do th three months yeah. worth of work. Yeah, yeah. Because ultimately, they're trying to plan to reduce uncertainty. Mm -hmm. But the, the fundamental problem here is that one, well, their uncertainty is a major effect on it, but the uncertainty of conditions and time are unplannable almost right and so it gets it makes you really really thought you become a gambler like um again for you know as uh, coming from a project management background where a lot of project managers are kind of like professional sacrifices so their job is to be and again this is a reference that a lot of you won't get but there's a film called the wicker man and i don't mean the nicholas <laughs> the cage wicker man the bees. not the bees not the bees no bees no, i remember i saw the original it's the guy that played the equalizer, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I saw that when was... I was a kid, and I felt like it scarred. I was watching it thinking, I'm not going to be okay after this. No, no. My favorite actor, Edward Woodward, is he was also uh, Callan, which was a famous British TV show where he played like okay. a, a hitman. So it's very famous. Um, anyway, but spoiler alert, at the end, he's a sacrifice, okay, mm -hmm. to, to the pagan gods. And too often, project management has felt like this. Like, your job is to be accountable for the plan, and if yeah. the plan gets missed, your job is to be to throw yourself on your sword. And then we'll find someone else to own the plan. Yeah. And so what we did in that situation was, before we got into planning out low detail and doing what you said, massive, just we, we said, okay, at the cadence we're talking about, like mm -hmm. over 90 days or three, four months, we need to go a level or two up on what we're talking about. Okay. And so they would have like, they had like a dozen, we would call them now backlog items. They were just requirements, right. like a dozen requirements, right? Maybe two dozen requirements around billing, right? Well, what senior management's interested in is billing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not necessarily letter EC25 right. goes out on a Tuesday, which yeah. is like a, such a minor thing. A senior leader doesn't care, they're not interested. What they're interested in is like, can you get me billing by Christmas? And, and I so, assume that there's some things in there that you have to be able to do. Like you have to be able yeah. to send a bill and receive yeah. payment. Yeah, exactly. There's like there's features in there that are compulsory to achieve that. Like the yeah. MVP, we would say now, as mm -hmm. we wouldn't say back then. And there are things in there that aren't. And by committing to the low level of detail, they were just wrapping in the nice to haves with stuff that's essential but isn't really, with the real essential stuff, treating mm -hmm. all the same and just failing. And so all we did was take their kind of commitments up a couple of levels to high, like, again, these days, what would we call them? Big hairy goals, OKRs, mm -hmm. we'll say these days, North Star metrics, whatever jargon you want to use. But yeah. basically, big items, not small items. Okay. And high level items, not low level items. Okay. And by doing that, it gave the team wiggle room to actually deliver. So they okay. could drop things out and move things around while still achieving the large things needed by the enterprise business so they so have to understand have the, the, the business outcome that's being sought not yeah. the subtask that has to be completed on tuesday at 907 exactly exactly so again and again now things have matured even more yeah because the, the outcome word is a really powerful one i think from what they were looking at was purely on prioritizing Delivery. functionality yeah. and pulling out the key function when in fact we start looking at outcomes sometimes it isn't functionality at all Right. It can be like, oh, that just needs to be someone with a phone could cover mm -hmm. that gap while we build it. And so that's one way just to take all the heat out of it. But okay. it does mean your quarterly plan has to have the ability to, well, let's put it this way. So some people, again, in the agile world, we call it uh, like a release train is the language mm -hmm. that often gets used. And the idea of a release train is uh, the train stops at certain stations. Um, the train will pull out the station at a certain time. If you are on time, you are on the train and your scope comes along. But if you're running late, the train does not stop for you. So the, the train pulls out the station and your scope is left there on the platform going, oh, I've missed the train. <laughs> um, but the idea is you don't let some minor feature hold up everyone at the train station. Okay. Like uh, for me in the UK, before all COVID happened, I, again, America, your trains, not great. But over yeah. here, our trains, 
I'm not great, <laughs> but, but I used to get the train all the time from London, where everything happens in the UK, to Bristol, where I live. And I, I would love to say on a Friday night, rushing to the station, there was a, a message saying, the train on platform five is delayed because Nigel Baker is stuck on the Bakerloo line. You know, but it doesn't. The train pulls out the station without me. It doesn't right? care, yeah. It doesn't care because if it waits for me, it waits for the next person. It waits for everyone. It slows everything so, down, yeah. So, so the date is key. Scope is flexible. So that's the idea. But what you spotted and what I spotted is a lot of people don't treat them like release trains. Right. They treat them like cattle carts. Now, mm -hmm. I have to say now, Dave, this shows my ignorance of America. Because the only thing I know about America is I've seen old westerns where you have like the old western train, you know, yeah. with the little cow poke on the front and things. And yeah. in the back of the trains, they put the the the, the, caboose. the steer, the the, oh, um, right. the what do you call it? the the caboose, the cattle. Yeah, the cattle go in, and they oh, all get with right. the train. The train rides along with all the cattle in the train. Yeah, so they load the cattle on the train and choo choo choo. We and call the cattle, it a cattle no. car. Cattle car. There we go. Cattle car. Right. Well, the trouble with cattle cars are the cattle can't choose to get on and off, can they? It's not like the right. cattle can't miss the train. They get put on the train and they get held on the train. And so the big danger that we spotted here in terms of quarterly planning is not quarterly planning per se. It's okay. quarterly planning with no capacity to replan as you go. I the scope is fixed yes. in the, in yes, the plan. Yes, absolutely. Right? And so you can't learn, cattle, you can't inspect and adapt. You can't innovate. You can't change your mind. Yeah. And that's absolutely deadly. That's the deadly thing. And so it's okay to have long cadences in terms of strategic planning, but you've got to have the ability for people to get on and off that train as you go okay. and for things to change on that train as you go. And if you don't, you're just hoping. Which and Hope is not a strategy. It's tough because management needs to have enough of a plan to be able to organize the business. They want to have assurances about what they're going to get, but they also want to be able to change their mind whenever they yeah. want about what they're going to get. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, this is where we just have to spell out the game to them. Yeah. Uh, because, again, oh, again, we call it a game, but it is pretty much a game, which is, uh, I, again, people talk about this as this great innovation, but it's been around forever. But if we're the reason why we build incrementally is so people can change their minds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the reason why we build like incrementally, incrementally, so we don't just build like, every two weeks, we build it in small slices, sure. is so people can change their mind. And it's not so much... It could be that they look at it and go, ah, oh, that's what I meant, but I don't like it. It could just be, here's a new thing. We don't need this old thing. But there's a trade-off here, which is we'll make incrementally so you can change your mind. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to build incrementally, we have to be able to release things, drop things, if you put new things in. And so, yes. uh, and so the danger with all these games are, if you don't play the game by the right rules, you're doomed. So okay. there used to be a there used to be a, a game I used to play. I play with my kids actually to this day. Again, I don't. It's an American game, but I don't know if you still play it. It's a board game called Buckaroo, where you get Never this plastic. We get a, it's like a plastic donkey, right? And a plastic donkey is rigged to jump. And so and what you have to do is you have to put on the donkey a variety of what I can only describe as faux Americana, like okay. a cowboy hat or like a you know very much like a very cliched. Yeah, and you put one on, and you each take turns putting one on. And the person who puts it on in the box, ah, you okay. lost back of it, you know. And it's like, it's basically, it's Russian roulette, just without the gun or the Russians. It's like everyone's taking it to, no, oh, I've been back of anyway, Right. The people play it wrong. <laughs> so I, my kids play it, they get the, the donkey, and they just keep loading things on to set it off. Yeah. Ah, and it's like, well, you've, you missed the point. <laughs> the entire point of this game is to... But your kids know that's going to happen. I think a lot of people they, in business pretend it's not going to happen. We can just keep loading more onto the donkey. Yeah. But I think they're loading on to wait for the buckaroo. They, 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 they load, load, load and wait for the team to say... But a lot of teams don't say. They're what afraid they just to do say. Is, yeah, they just fail. And so it just crashes and burns. And so then, then we're into like Russian roulette. Actual, it's not okay. safe to fail. A, a game like Buckaroo is safe to fail. My kids go, hey, and it's, you know, it's all happy. A lot of the decisions, a lot of the way we run the work, uh, decisions are not safe to fail. And I don't just mean for the team. Okay. I mean for management and yeah. leaders. And so the problem is they can't learn because they're doomed Sure. because <laughs> it goes horribly wrong. And so what we've got to, to get quarterly planning working is you just need to have those release files as you go along. Well, I want to ask about this because this is something that I've really struggled in having this conversation. And I'll try to like lay it out as simply as I can. 
a lot of the people that I've talked to in this situation, they, they recognize that it's more than they can do. And I'll say, well, why did you agree to it? And they say, well, we don't have an option. We have to. And I say, okay, so you said yes to something you know you can't do. And now you're planning it into sprints. You're putting too much work in there that you know you can't do. Well, we have to do it. But you just said you can't. Well, we can't. But we have to. I'm like, have you ever completed your work in a sprint? Not in the last three years. So why do you keep saying that you can? Because yeah. if you follow that back upstream, then I say I can do an impossible thing. You plan your department's yeah. work around it. That escalates all the way up. Now, the whole company is planning its business on a yeah. whole bunch of teams that are saying, yes, I can eat 700 hot dogs in 10 minutes. Yeah. Knowing full well they can't. Yeah, the yeah. whole company's at risk. Yeah, yeah. So, what 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 should the teams be doing? Well, the teams, like I said, for me, human beings are really good when they've got feedback loops. Okay. So when they see something happen and get feedback, right? Human beings are really rubbish when they haven't got feedback loops. And okay. We do silly things. So the example I've often used is my oldest daughter. I could, she's now eleven. I remember when she was like two. She was in the kitchen. Uh, she was stood by the oven. The oven's quite hot. Yeah. So I said, don't stand by the stove or whatever. I said, don't, don't touch the stove. It's hot. She went, okay, Danny. So you won't touch it, will you? Promise you won't touch it. You won't touch it, will you, Danny? I turned my back. Ah! I did this. I did this. Yeah. My parents were like, all right, yeah. fine, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. But I knew she was fine. But I knew she would be fine. It was, it was Her fingers were red. It wasn't that hot. No, I had but a she terrible didn't touch blister. the stove. It's, yeah. it's ca ca cause and effect, right? Mm -hmm. Yet we know people who smoke. And smoking is like utterly deadly gonna kill you killed my mother it's just a horrible thing to do and i mention that and people go oh yeah it's awful isn't it god i'm dying for a cigarette yeah you know because the feedback loop on death is out there somewhere but the feedback loop on the cigarette's quite short and i sure. think there's a name there's a name in psychology for it but i can't remember the exact name but it's something to do with short-term bias like yeah. i the, the short-term feedback loop overrules the long-term feedback loop yeah which kills us a lot of the time right so we could use this example in two ways one is the team is overemphasizing their short-term feedback loop. So they're okay. going, I say yes now, so I don't get in pain now. I get a pat I'm on the head. Yeah. pain till later, right? Mm -hmm. Which is not a good idea because uncertainty wounds you and makes you anxious and kills you, right? Yeah. But it's also an issue for the leadership, which is the leaders aren't getting a good feedback loop. So yeah. they think things are okay. They think, okay, I need all this. Yes. Good but stuff. do you, do you, you think know, that do you think they really to... think it's okay, or do you think I, I get the vibe that a lot of them, and this is something that carries over from project management. I will impose this on you, and I will turn the screws, and you will make it happen, or I will find the next person no. who will do well, it. Well, that can be seen to be leadership, but they, yeah. oh, they can do it if they try hard. They just need to leadership. try hard, you know. Yeah, but but it's not leadership; it's abuse. But but yeah. again. But the point is, you've got to give the leaders the choice to do that. I don't mean the choice to be evil. You've just got to give them the choice to have something beyond wow. evil. You've got to give them the chance to say, look, like here's evidence for you yeah. to make better choices. Now, if you're going to make bad choices, that's fine. That's what happens. But I need to give them the opportunity to do that. So Otherwise, I, they're all they will take is the bad choice. I never thought about this before, but yeah. it ties into something another guy, Michael Grill, said in a mm. Michael Grill said in a podcast about how his team's job was to QA the plan they were given. Yeah. If I'm on a team that's been asked to do an impossible thing, if I don't say back to management, "Hey, we can't do this," I am robbing them of the opportunity to be yeah. better leaders and to make yeah. good choices for the business. Yeah. It's yeah. selfish. Yeah. Yeah. In a way. You're hurting them. And, yeah. and you're hurting their opportunity to be better. And hurting actually, yourself because you know you yeah. can't do it. Yeah, yeah. And so it's all about, it's all humans in the end. It's humans all the way down, you know. Yeah. It, uh, uh, what, another issue I get is like in the book, Crucial Conversations, they talk about like when people tell a story, they can often fall into three clever traps. You know, I think it's victim, villain, helpless. Mm -hmm. You know, like, oh, that person's awful. They're like Darth Vader. Or well, this person's, oh, I'm, you know, I've been abused. Leave me alone. And yeah. or helpless. What can I do? I can do anything. But they're all, they're, they're clever stories, self-soothing stories, yeah. not reality. And so it's getting people to understand, okay, your boss is probably not Darth Vader. They could be, but probably not. Right? Yeah. Now, they've got kids. They've got a house. They've got a mortgage. They're probably not. So something else is going on here. Let's discuss it. Right, and you're also probably well, not the villain either. Had kids. <laughs> Wait, did he have a mortgage? That's the question. Uh, and in the end, he turned back to the light side when he got good coaching from his son. Um, and so the point about Darth well Vader played. is not to bring up Darth Vader, though I have got a Darth Vader here just in case anyone wants to see it. 
<laughs> I find your lack of faith disturbing. <laughs> um, for the for the people listening, that was a Darth Vader toy. Um, but the point of all this is, is I need to help them have better information. So what I do in the team, and mm-hmm. I, I love this as a team. So I think it was Aristotle. I think it's Aristotle had like a model for persuasion. Okay. And the model for persuasion is like three things. To pers- if you're going to persuade someone or influence someone, your argument has to have three things. Like logos. Right? So logic has okay. to have evidence, has to have proof. Yeah. So I'm a great believer in generating evidence. Okay. So when people say we can't do this much work, why not? How? Why can't you? Well, things like velocity or throughput or whatever you want to measure, but some actual evidential proof to say, look, over the last 10 years, We've managed to do X. Right. You're asking for Y. We've never achieved Y in our history. Evidence. There is nothing quite like bringing facts to an opinion fight. Because you know, everyone's got an opinion. And your boss is more important than you. They've got more I opinions. I always say than... I show up with history and math and no one can ever beat me. Yeah, but it's true, isn't it? Because they go, I feel. They go, I don't care how you feel. Look at my I numbers. Feel, yeah. I've got the numbers, right? And so it really backs you up. Yeah. However, numbers and logic are not enough. Because uh, they can influence, but you need more. And yeah. so you need two other things. So Aristotle talked about pathos, mm-hmm. which is passion, uh, but it's storytelling. It's humanity. And so I would always say to someone, look, if I'm going to go up there with, with my slides to say, look at this issue, look at these numbers, right. I also tailor my story carefully. I practice the story. It can't be adversarial. It yeah. can't be combative because we're all on the same side. Right. And if I try and compete, remember, the highest paid person, Hippo. Yeah. Right? Well, the hippo is allegedly the second most dangerous animal in Africa after the mosquito. So, wow. like, they're, they're very dangerous. Oh, I love the hippo. Ah! And so, I'm going to go in there with the right tone, speaking right. Um, honestly, maybe from low status, tentatively, but I'm going to practice my pitch. I'm going to practice my communication of how I'm going to get this point across. And I'm going to spell it out in human terms as well. Mm-hmm. I look at the impact on the teams. These people are overworked, they're stressed. We've got, look at the numbers, we've got levers, yeah. we're, we're outsourced, people aren't working with us anymore. And the, But the final thing is, and this is the third thing, is who's telling that story? So Aristotle okay. called it ethos. He said ethics, like you need to be coming from the right place. You need to be a person of substance, like okay. someone believable. Like the joke I've made in the past about this is, imagine we're on a chicken farm, right? Because right. I don't know when this is coming out, but Chicken Run 2 is about to appear on Netflix. Do you know okay. Chicken Run, the yeah. film with, with chickens? Made by Arvin Animation. They're just up the road for me in Bristol. Uh, I saw a presentation by Pete Lord, the owner of Ardman, a couple of weeks ago. He showed okay. me some of Chicken Run. looked great. Anyway, imagine we're on a chicken farm like that, right? And, oh, my God, it's been awful. You know, cages and fences and, oh, it's just been a lockdown. I don't know if you mm-hmm. realize this, but um, birds have had the same issue, not with COVID, but with yeah, bird flu. But with birds, so they, they just kill them, them all. Down. Yeah, they kill them all. It's awful, right? So imagine we're having an election for mayor of the chicken farm. Okay. And I say, chickens, chickens, you've been oppressed too long. You've been oppressed, held in your cages, held behind fences, trapped, unable to see your family, your children ripped from you as eggs. Yeah. Uh, no more. I'm going to bring you, I'm going to make chickens great again. I'm going to get down the fences, take down the fences. We're going to get rid of the hen houses. We're going to allow you to wander wherever you like. You want to go into the forest on your own at night? Completely fine. You can live independently, live free on the land. Right. My name is Mr. Fox. Yeah. My name is Mr. Fox, and I endorse this message. So the, so the, the source <laughs> of the story yeah. is a big part of the context of the source. It's a of the story. big part of the context. Because yeah. what does the fox want? He's going to eat chickens. Yeah. Of course he's going to say that. Right. And so what you have to do with this type of thing, if you're going to persuade leaders, it has to be the right people bringing the message. Right? Yeah. And it's always, again, back into Agile. Because I love Agile, because we've got these job school scrub masters who are people who are basically independent of content. They're basically there to work on process and people. Mm-hmm. And they can have, they can be seen as far more neutral than other people involved. Yeah. You know, they can go and say, look, remember, my job is not like worrying if this is here or this is there. My job is about the process, about the people. So I'm here representing you on the ground. I'm, okay. I'm authentic. Right. This is what's going on for you. Okay. As leaders, this is what's yeah. happening. And this is what we need to do. 
Now, now as a scrum master, you, if you carry on with this, actually, as a scrum master, you know, my life's similar, probably. But so I, I've got authenticity. Yeah. Uh, and this is why we've got to be very careful in large organizations. Because one of the key things for me about changing large organizations like this, and this is a, a change, yeah, is not just the messaging, not just the evidence, not just the person, but have I built up enough substance to challenge? Enough credibility. How yeah. enough credibility. So, and so that's hard for a lot of us because people have treated us poorly and yeah. we've played that role. So we've, we've acted like the servants of sure. the business and then, then our voices are not sufficiently strong. So I want to stick on this one for a second because there's mm. two, two things that I'm thinking of with it. One is that part of why I'm – always always harping on teams about meeting their commitments in the sprint is because if you don't meet your commitment they're not going to trust you no matter what you say whether you overshoot or undershoot if you say you can do a thing and you do a thing and you repeat that then when you say you can't yeah. do a thing yeah. they're more likely to believe yeah. 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 um yeah. and i totally forgot what my other point with it was but that that oh i know what the other point was you're talking about being persuasive and, te and telling mm. stories and one of the core things to me that is what makes somebody a good scrum master yeah. is social engineering because that's everything you just described. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and it's why I, why I find so interesting in the world of work is like when I worked years ago in companies, there would be scrum masters all over the place, but they just weren't called scrum masters. <laughs> they, they had different job titles, different names, yeah. but they lived and they breathed those behaviours. Yeah. Whether you call it servant leadership or whatever, but they acted in this authentic, true way. And as we've gone through the last 10 years, we see more and more Scrum Master job titles, mm -hmm. but less and less people acting in the right ways. And I think that's interesting. I think that's something to watch out for. Like, if you, if you have got Scrum Masters listening to this, I would say, remember the authenticity, remember the persuasion, remember you're a change agent, not just a facilitator. But even as a PM, if yeah. I'm a project manager, I think it's important for me to understand the people side. Oh, I, yeah, I, absolutely. All, all projects are change. All projects are change, so well, I'm a change agent. You know, all that, projects are about people, so I need to serve and lead them. This is the thing that I'm wondering about, because when I realized that I was project manager was something that like I was a natural fit for, mm -hmm. that became my path. And I was going to study every aspect of it that I could find, which is what led me into studying emotional mm -hmm. intelligence and social engineering and all the other stuff. But I see a lot of people now treating the job of Scrum Master like it's a transitional role like mm. you're you're on a team you want to be a coach so you got to be a scrum master for a little while yeah. so they don't invest themselves in it as a career path they don't oh. study it with the level of mm. ardor that they should and then you end up with these kind of weak scrum masters who are just pushing stuff yeah. around yeah i'm i'm so I, i'm one of the for my sins one of the earliest people who had the job title agile coach Okay. So not the first, but one of the early, one of the very early doors. Okay. I remember when I had the job title Agile Coach, I went looking for another job. Why wouldn't you? And there was one job open on the internet in Europe for an Agile Coach. Wow. And I knew the person who had it open. So what was year like, was this? What this year was, was this? 2006, 2005. Okay. 2005, I think. Uh, maybe six. But it was like, it's still not many out there with that job title. Yeah. And so I had a big, I've always had a big love for being an agile coach. And I spent years, for instance, trying to persuade people that, you know, the job title agile coach requires some coaching. <laughs> You'd have yeah. to be a coach to be able to do it, man. And so I'm hugely invested in this job title, hugely invested. But I get more and more worried that the way agile coaching is, is as happening in wider organizations at the moment is a bit of an anti pattern. Yeah. It's a bit of a robbing the organization of what it really needs to be about. Yeah. You know, you need leadership at all levels. You don't just need a few people floating around with post-it notes and, and Jira tickets and right. giving advice. That's not good enough. Like for me, Scrum Master is an upgrade of Agile Coach, not the other way around. Why? Because uh, Agile Coach can walk away. There, do you remember? Oh, okay, Dave, this is an old school reference for the Scrum people here. The old pig and chicken joke from Scrum. Yes. The, 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 uh, the people, I still don't not... know why that was ever called a joke. It's not funny in it's any funny. way. Wait, wait. Let, let's see if I can make it funny for your audience. Ready? Let's, let's see if I can do it. All right. Spoiler alert, audience. I can't. So, a pig and a chicken get together. The chicken turns to the pig and says, Hey, pig, I think we should open a restaurant together. And the pig thinks for a moment and goes, Ah. Uh, I'm not sure about this. What do we call it? 
and the chicken thinks and says, how about ham and eggs? And the pig freaks out. He goes, no way! You'd be just involved, but I'll be committed. <laughs> yeah, not funny. But Never the point funny. is, the chicken, she can walk away at any time, mm-hmm. and the pig's leg's on the line. Um, now, here's the joke, though. Agile coaches are chickens. <laughs> they can walk off. They can go, oh, yeah. that bit of advice, buck, 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 go over here, buck, 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 go over there. Scrum masters are committed. They've got they're skin stuck. in the game. Okay. They're, they're responsibility and accountable because they're part of the team. Right. And that's more powerful. And so I think you're right. Uh, I did a presentation in Amsterdam for the Scrum Gathering, and my big thing was about how Scrum Mastery is undervalued, which is hilarious since I think collectively we've all trained like 2 million Scrum Masters. Yeah. But it's undervalued as a concept, like the idea of a servant leader, change agent, a facilitator and a coach wrapped into one, dedicated to people, dedicated to results, dedicated yeah. to teams. And yeah, I think a lot of what we see with what I would call agile scaling anti-patterns, of mm-hmm. which this is one, like quarterly planning going wrong. Sure. It's normally like an agile scaling anti-pattern. It's one of the, one of the key causes of this mm-hmm. is not just bad leadership or weak teams is a lack of connecting feedback tissue between those two worlds Mm -hmm. and a lack of supporting tissue supporting those worlds and that is all supposed to be scrum mastery that is all what scrum mastery is supposed to be and i think that's my concern it's why i get so nervous when these organizations say oh we've learned agile now we don't need yeah and it's kind of like saying oh um the chicago bulls we know how to play basketball, Fire the coach. so we don't need a coach. Yeah. Yeah. We'll just go on the field and make it up like the Harlem Globetrotters. And it's, you know, that's not, you know, Globetrotters are not a great example. Yeah. And so, so I think. Hmm. I want to see if I can tie it back together because we do have to, I yeah. know, we've got to go in a second. Um, if, if you're doing quarterly planning, it seems mm-hmm. to me like it would be important to know what problem you wanted to solve. Yeah. But then you actually have to ask the question is what we're doing solving the problem? Because mm-hmm. it sounds to me like, from what I hear from a lot of people, is they're just pushing it around, pretending it's okay. You know, they'll fix yeah. it tomorrow, but they never yeah. fix it. No, and they're just building up issues for themselves. Yeah. And so, for me, the way to handle it is to you can plan quarterly if you want, but it's going to change daily. There needs to be pressure release systems like scope control and leaders. You need to be making commitments or forecast to leaders yeah. at the right level which is higher level not because we don't want to because reality doesn't let us go to a low yeah. level but but those high level things are important that's the big achievable things the business is built on yeah. and so then we try hard to achieve those high level things but cool. we've got flexibility and scope to do that yeah cool. and that's why a lot of companies are moving away from that model like i've seen before i we call it like a train but the other two models i've seen have been like like the london underground where people are launching every sprint okay mm-hmm. now that's more technically difficult but oh my gosh it takes away the political pressure yeah because if you're doing it things every let's say 12 13 weeks if you've got a bit of scope falling out on week 13 or falling in there's a lot it's of not pressure not just from leaders yeah. stakeholders saying look if you can get that one in, like I'm going to lean on you to get that one in. Yeah. But if it's if you're doing a two week cadence, then if something falls out of two weeks, oh well, never mind. Yeah. It comes next week. And in fact, what I'm seeing in some of the best businesses I'm working with, and you get the feedback is, faster yeah, too. Instantly, instant feedback. And plus, if you miss it, just wait for the next tube. Yeah. Always do in London. But the final one I wanted to mention quickly because it is cutting edge, but I am seeing it is organisations basically spending a bit of money and building what I would call a motorway. Okay. You would call it a freeway. They're building effectively like a technical structure, which is a freeway. So spending a bit of money building up the technical infrastructure to mm-hmm. build like a concrete road, and then everyone can just drive on and off it whenever they need. Like So it's like you, you imagine going on holiday on the freeway. You leave when you want to leave. You stop where you want to stop. You, yeah. And everyone's cadence is released. They don't have to work together. They don't have to. They can all just flow around each other like cars on a motorway or cars on a freeway, all continuously delivering and moving. It does require technical infrastructure that supports that. So that right. is hard. So you can't just say, oh, just do this. But the, some of the cooler ones are going there, and they're big, but they've got strong technical structures, like the concrete underneath the roads. And then all these little projects all broken up into smaller slices, yeah. releasing two weeks, three weeks, two days, whenever they need to. And okay. the people who want to release once a quarter, they like, like my, my dad. My dad would never stop if he's on a trip. 
you go for a toilet before you leave the house because we're not stopping. We're driving a long way. Now, yeah. again, Americans, when I say a long way, I mean like three hours, which for you is the shops. Uh, yeah. But for us, it's halfway across the country, right? Okay. But me, when I drive with my kids, we stop all the time. Yeah. Oh, there's a castle. Uh, oh, there's a there's a motorway services. Oh, let's go yeah. there. Oh, there's 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 a petrol station or oh, sorry, gas station. And okay. we just and so all everyone's got their own choices, and so the organisation is generally agile. Yeah, everyone's self organising, cross functional, moving around. But it does take effort to get there. So I want to come back and do another one about that if you're up mm-hmm. for it. Oh, definitely, definitely. Okay. All right, because we do have to close out, but I want to go back to the question that we ended the podcast, which will be on the Lost Reels version, (laughs) Um, but I'm going to change it a little bit. So Nigel and I, you weren't here. Most of you, we were here. We talked about Doctor Who for a while before we started. There's a brand new Mm -hmm. David Tennant's back for whatever reason to get people to watch again. Um, And here's the scenario. So you can take any two companions you can still mm-hmm. go anywhere in time and space you want but yeah. you get two companions and where where are you going to take them two companions and where would i take them so the companions i have a great soft spot for rose the first companion of new who right because i think she's an interesting person and a great character i think she's got a lot to her. there's still a lot of story left to tell with her and a great accent. she came along now but what she came along now she's in her mid-40s like me she would be a completely different person having a completely different adventure but the what and so that's one but what about one, mickey the idiot no no and most most of them knew i miss mickey companions are not great but old who had some great companions okay like oh, some great companions in old doctor who but i would go right back to the start and take susan who was the doctor's okay. granddaughter right who was written out very quickly because they didn't want to give the doctor a granddaughter um i was once trained by the actress wow so i i did a um a presentation skills course uh this is now back in the 20th century and she delivered it i did not know who she was at the time because i was 21 or 22 okay. um, but all the middle-aged men in the course were just beside themselves with That's excitement cool. with her teaching and um, but so i would like to see that character back because i just think that would be very interesting. All right, I think so that Susan could be interesting and Rose. A lot of legs. Where are you yeah. going to take them? I, where would I take them? I would like to go somewhere new and interesting because Doctor Who's notorious for keep going back to the same places. Yeah. So I'd like to go somewhere new and interesting. Um, again, funny story. They've been filming a lot of Doctor Who around my, my city. So okay. it's been filmed in Bristol. So literally a mile from my house, they were filming Doctor Who a few weeks ago. Um, they, they've done a lot of filming around the area. Um, okay. So where I would take them is a deserted quarry somewhere in Britain where they've done a lot of filming in the past. Okay. I think it's not Doctor Who unless they're wandering around a uh, deserted quarry with some uh, bad special effects to make the sky look green. Because okay. for me, that's Doctor Who. Like, they're all you modern effects people, but I need my Doctor Who effects you want created the like they've done by a child. Chunky monsters. Okay. Oh, so chunky. I love a chunky monster. So I would take, I'm still going to take Rory because I miss mm-hmm. Rory. And I'm still going to go to that Sex Pistol show on July 4th, 1976. Yeah. Uh, I think it was July 4th in, in England. Which but, everyone went to. Everyone allegedly yeah. went to. But I'm going to take Adric. Oh, Adric, the, the one who died. Yeah, because I sacrificed himself. But I... Yeah. I've always, I was very sad when that happened. And, and I, I, I watched it live, not live, obviously, but the, when it was shown, I, I watched that episode. And when the credits rolled in silence, I was very, very moved. I think I was child. crying Never seen it when before. he died. Yeah, yeah, that was a very Never sad thing. Yeah. This was awesome. So if people want to get in touch with you to talk about Doctor Who or any of the things we've covered in this podcast, what's the best way for them to reach you? So they can reach me uh, through our website, agilebear.com. Okay. Um, or if you want to have a chat, LinkedIn's the best place. I'm Nigel E. Baker on LinkedIn. Get me on that. You can have a okay. chat. I do tweet very occasionally now because that's a dumpster fire surrounded by a sea of dumpster fires living in a paradox universe where multi-universe dumpster fires <laughs> are flying in from different universes and crashing into the dumpster fire, causing like a whole explosion of space and time um so you could get me on there but i'd like to be trying to fight for my life so probably best is linkedin well i'll put links to all of it in the show notes and thank you very (laughs) much for your time and for doing this again it's been great fun Uh, this one i've enjoyed just as much as the last one and i can't wait for the the third of the trilogy (laughs) the third of the trilogy that'll be brilliant cool thanks man
Cheers. If you learn to work the old way, but the new